So coming up now, um, I'm hoping that we have Adam Morton uh, from Rolls-Royce. So he's the head of environmental technology at Rolls-Royce, and he's going to take us uh, through what they're doing uh, in this space. So Adam, are you there and ready? Ah, there we are. Ah, sorry. Right. Yes. Thank you, Darren. Sorry. Um, yes, I am here. Um, Eric, can you can you see my Darren? Can you see my screen or? Uh, we, we, we can just see you're, you're, you're not sharing your video, uh, but I believe that Eric has your slides. Uh, okay, is, is right. Well, that's probably the, the, you've got the better part of the, uh, of the, uh, the visual. So uh, anyway. Um, right, here, we, here we go. So thank you very much. Um, so my name is Adam Morton. By day, I am Head of Environmental Technology for Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce spends a little bit more than 800 million pounds a year on improving the environmental performance of our products and a big part of my job is deciding how we deploy uh, those funds across the different sectors in which we operate so civil defense power systems and nuclear uh, but also across the different environmental media so decarbonization local air quality noise vibration and increasingly uh, non-carbon greenhouse gas emissions um, and when I'm not uh, head of environmental technology for Rolls Royce, then I also act as the chair of sustainable aviation. And I'm here today in that capacity to talk about the sustainable aviation carbon roadmap 20, uh, 2019 2020 that we've been working on and we released back in February. We've been working on for about eight, 18 months. Uh, and so uh, we'd like to uh, give you an overview of uh, what we've what we've come up with. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of who we are, we were founded in 2005 and we we're a collection of some of the key players, many of the key players from UK airlines, from airports, from the aerospace manufacturers, and also the air navigation services provider, NATS. Um, the aim is to be collaborative, and it's to be collaborative, finding ways to be cleaner, quieter, and smarter in terms of aviation. Um, we're not just concerned with decarbonization, although that's the principal focus today. We're also concerned with local air quality, noise, and increasingly non-carbon uh, non greenhouse gases. Um, what I'd like to do is set the scene in terms of the, um, next slide please, set the scene in terms of the climate challenge that we face. So as many of you will be aware, uh, in 2015 nearly 200 signatories signed an agreement, the Paris Agreement, aiming to keep the increase in global average temperatures to less than 2 degrees Celsius. As recently as the middle of October 2018, the, uh, the IPCC uh, published a report that identified the need to limit global average temperatures to less than one and a half degrees centigrade if irreversible damage is to be avoided. Um, that occurred in between the previous roadmap that we published in 2016 and the one that we just published and is strongly reflected in the changes that we've made since then. There's a recognition, a growing recognition that a 1.5 degree temperature limit is, is essential and this has subsequently been linked to the need to reach net zero by 2050. Although the Paris Agreement was largely uh, silent in terms of uh, reaching net zero for aviation and marine, the sectors that I'm principally concerned with, it was, it was always assumed that it would occur some way into the second half of, uh, second half of this century. And effectively, it's safe to say that um, the IPCC outputs brought forward the need to decarbonize aviation by at least two decades. Next slide, please. Um, we're not the only organization uh, that's um, working hard to decarbonize aviation. The UK Committee on Climate Change, the independent organisation that, that guides the government on carbon budgets and decarbonisation, um, put out a report uh, May, of, uh, May of last year, 
And one of the main conclusions was a recommendation that the UK government should set a target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. This was defined as 100% full compared to 1990 baselines. And crucially, this sought to include aviation emissions within, the, uh, within those targets. Um, both SA and the Committee on Climate Change committed the same overall uh, outcomes, but have very different paths in terms of how that, that's um, proposed to be achieved. Um, SA would argue that for us, there's less emphasis on people flying less, there's less emphasis on modal shifts from aviation to uh, trains in some circumstances. SA do not intrinsically link net zero and constraints on aircraft expansion. We think that some aircraft, uh, some uh, airport expansion is possible uh, in a net zero context. Um, SA also believes in slightly reduced reliance on the need for greenhouse gas removal as part of the solutions put forward and also believes that SAF has a bigger role to play than the, uh, the findings within the CCC report. Next slide, please. Um, what I'd like to do before launching into the details of the carbon roadmap is to provide a bit of an overview of UK aviation in context. Um, it's important to, um, to recognise that aviation is not the UK's largest emitter. Uh, less than 8% of the CO2 emissions associated with the UK. It's smaller in magnitude than energy supply. It's smaller in magnitude than road and rail. It's smaller than business. It's smaller than residential. And it's also smaller than agriculture in terms of the CO2 that it emits. Um, UK aviation emissions um, peaked in 2006, 14 years ago, as far as carbon dioxide is concerned. And we have had some success in decoupling emissions from growth, with passenger numbers increasing at a much higher rate than the corresponding increase in, uh, in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, what does it give us in return? The numbers, uh, the numbers I'm about to give you are slightly out of date given the um, recent events around COVID-19. But, um, but fairly recently, it delivered £52 billion pounds to our GDP annually. Uh, it delivered £9 billion pounds to the Exchequer in the form of taxes. Uh, directly and indirectly employed about a million people. And, and our aerospace manufacturing sector um, exports goods and services worth about £26 billion pounds annually and is facing a market over the next 20 years equivalent to about 3.5 trillion pounds. Next slide, please. Um, so the decarbonisation roadmap itself, so the, the, the most recent version is the third version that we've produced. We originally uh, were the first to produce a decarbonisation roadmap for aviation back in 2008. Uh, and then we produced, a, we produced a second one in 2016. The 2016 version looked to a combination of improvements in aircraft and engine efficiency, uh, gains in terms of operations, improvements in or uh, greater use of sustainable aviation fuels, but targeted only a 50% reduction once uh, market-based measures were added in. Clearly, as I've, as, as I've said uh, previously, the, the impact of IPCC and increasing recognition of the need to move to net zero meant that sustainable aviation had to, uh, had to respond with the targets that we were setting going forwards. Um, the target is net zero. Uh, the latest report has a much bigger role for fuel substitution with uh, kerosene increasingly being replaced by sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, it builds on Corsia in a way that wasn't possible in 2016. The roadmap also uh, builds in a wider degree of expertise than we've had before across um, probably 90% of the aerospace sector in the country and believes that we can accommodate a 70% increase in passenger numbers while still uh, limiting our emissions to, um, to net zero in a, in a 2050 timescale. Next slide, please. 
Um, this means that um, uh, one of the first things that we've we've done is we've we've looked at the impact of carbon pricing on demand. Uh, there's been a considerable debate as to the degree which this is likely to be effective, and came to the conclusion that actually um, the the application of a carbon price uh, only uh, as high as 200, rising to as high as 221 pound per ton in 2050, only reduces the CO2 emissions in that year by 4.3 million tons out of a total of about 71 million tons uh, of carbon dioxide. And therefore it's, uh, it's crucially important that beyond that we start to, um, we start to apply a variety of other different measures. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, the first of those is moving to cleaner aircraft and engines. So um, SA have chosen in its roadmap to split known aircraft from future aircraft. The split point between the known aircraft chosen was 2035, with the latter including conventional and the first of the hybrid electric aircraft from 2035 onwards. Um, it was assumed pure electric would appear, start to appear in the mix from 2040 onwards. Um, known aircraft in the SA roadmap improve fleet average uh, fuel percentage by 17% um, versus a 20, uh, 2006 baseline, with future aircraft having the potential to further reduce CO2 by 24%, taking into account fleet composition. Beyond 2050, continued penetration of future aircraft will continue to have an impact and deliver fuel savings and uh, carbon, carbon improvements. Uh, but, um, but this was beyond the timeline that was chosen and it's not possible at this time to understand the extent to which that's likely to happen. Um, the assumptions recognise considerable investment by the government in the ATI, the Aerospace Technology Institute, and in projecting forward the sorts of gains that we would expect from improvements in cleaner aircraft and cleaner engines, we've assumed that there would be ongoing investment at the sorts of level or possibly more than have been enjoyed by the aviation sector uh, recently. Next slide, please. Um, next, we come to use of sustainable aviation fuels. So, sustainable aviation fuels now exist. They exist in a variety of forms. Six processes have been approved by the ASTM, the body that's responsible for certifying SAFs. Um, and each of these is capable of delivering life cycle CO2 benefits of at least 60%. We would argue that in a couple of years time that will look not terribly ambitious and figures above 80% will, uh, will become the norm. Uh, and SAFs are also delivering other gains uh, not just the uh, gains in terms of reduced carbon emissions, but reduced contrail formation because of the lower aromatics and hence lower particulates, reduced NOx, potential for reduced NOx. Uh, globally, at least, we're starting to see um, these benefits being recognised and starting to help to drive forward the penetration. So 14 airports routinely provide SAFs for blending with kerosene. And airlines and airports are making investments alongside technology developers to deliver the necessary SAFs that um, will form an important part of decarbonising not just UK aviation but aviation globally. And already first of a kind plants are under construction initially in the US and some parts of Europe but we're expecting to have final investment decisions by plants next year in the UK if the necessary uh, support can be found to, uh, to drive those forwards. Uh, next slide, please. Um, through modelling by consultancy for tech, um, the carbon roadmap concludes that um, SAF production in the UK uh, could deliver 2.8 million tonnes of CO2 savings by 2035. That's the start of the process, and by 20 50, uh, we believe that 32% of carbon savings from aviation could be met with 4.5 million tonnes per year of SAF. Uh, this will require a huge effort, but in return, 
uh, annual growth rates of 11%, which is the, the sort of growth rates that we're talking about, are not inconsistent with the kinds of growth rates that we've seen uh, from, uh, from biofuels more widely in other transport sectors. The development of this domestic industry could deliver gross value added to the UK even in the short term, so the 2035 number in excess of £700 million per year, uh, support over 5,200 jobs and provide additional employment associated with export opportunities. Next slide, please. Um, however, uh, the course of this is not inevitable and um, cross-government strategic co coordination will be necessary, possibly through a dedicated office, um, such as office, the Office for Sustainable Aviation Fuels, Flagship funding will be necessary for a first of a kind pilot plant at the level of circa 500 million pounds. Changes to the RTFA in order to allow for additional feedstocks, including no base associated with recycled carbon and uh, multiplier based incentives to allow SAF to compete fairly with biodiesel and ensure that uh, appropriate amounts of feedstock are directed across the two, uh, the two opportunities. Uh, coming to slide 11, um, air traffic and management have not been, uh, have not been ignored. Uh, the progress to date in addressing efficiency through uh, air traffic management and, offs, and, and ops gives some confidence that um, there will be scope to deliver savings in terms of CO2 in this space as well. Already improvements in efficiency of UK airspace um, uh, under NATS control have reduced CO2 by 10% relative to a 2006 baseline. And this is partly due to a number of different factors, partly through more direct routes, better flight profiles, optimized speed profiles, but also better coordination between airspace sectors. On the aircraft operations side, the most recent roadmap recognizes electrically aided taxing. Uh, and this is part of wider efforts to, uh, to improve electrification in, uh, in ground operations going forwards uh, and APU substitution through either uh, fixed electrical ground power or even GPUs potentially re removes the extent to which APUs will be operated, fuel will be burnt and then corresponding carbon dioxide emitted. Um, the net effect of um, both improved operations and airspace management, we believe, um, we believe can deliver um, just over 7% of the total percentage of UK aviation CO2 in a 2050 timescale. And um, we'd also argue that given that, uh, despite the fact that um, we're looking to deliver these, these sorts of benefits over a long period of time, the relatively, uh, aging airspace means that the sorts of investment necessary in these areas should be made sooner rather than later. Uh, next slide please. Um, at this point um, we, get to, um, we get to a point where we've, we've considered uh, CO2 savings from carbon pricing and the impact that has on demand of about 4.3 million tonnes We've considered the CO2 savings from known aircraft and new aircraft. That comes to about 23.5 million tonnes. Uh, the impact of uh, sustainable aviation fuels on CO2 emissions comes to about 14.4 million tonnes and then 3.1 million tonnes from better ATM and ops. This leaves a residual of about 26 million tonnes in the carbon roadmap. Uh, for 2019 2020. Um, clearly, Corsia will play an important part in the near term in delivering the kinds of um, uh, non technical uh, or, or non aircraft, non airport um, emission savings that are important. From 2021 onwards, airlines will be required to pay to reduce the CO2 through qualifying projects. However, with a limited Corsia lifetime from 2035 onwards, um, it will be necessary to introduce additional measures which drive investment in important uh, technologies and projects. Clearly, natural carbon sinks 
uh, such as improving soil and peatland CO2 absorption are one option. Um, but bringing these schemes to fruition uh, is still proving challenging and will require more effort and support from, uh, from both governments and, uh, and the private sector. Um, the SA uh, agreed that other technology focused carbon removal approaches will be necessary. This is one area where we, we diverge slightly from the Commission on Climate Change because we, we're of the opinion that uh, one of the principal methods, which is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, the, um, the feedstocks and the biomass diverted into um, BECs would be better deployed in, um, in being diverted towards the production of sustainable aviation fuels, whether that's biomass or waste. Um, direct air capture, uh, an additional GGR method, which we think would be important, but we would argue the, um, the level of maturity of the technology is somewhat less than the level of maturity of, the of some of the technologies that we've, we've put more highly in the, um, in the, in the programs that uh, we've got going forwards. Um, and uh, although we believe that BECT represents a key area for, um, for uh, addressing um, emissions from, from the sector, um, via uh, market-based measures and, and technical offsets, we think that's likely to come somewhat later in the uh, in the time frame. And uh, next slide, please. Um, the net effect of combining um, carbon pricing, more efficient aircraft and engines, sustainable aviation fuels, ops, air traffic management is um, that um, in our 2019 roadmap, um, we were able to, um, to bring the industry to the point where it could commit to support the net zero aviation carbon emissions by 2050, um, recognizing that this had to be an international approach working with governments around the world and through the UN. However, um, this requires collaborative, a collaborative approach not just from the organizations which are shown in the pledge at the bottom, but also with, um, with support from, from governments in the public sector, both in the UK and, and more widely, um, in order to deliver the necessary technologies, SAF at the scale that, um, that can have the impact of um, the 32% CO2 saving that we've imagined, and also can, uh, can deliver the, the, the investment to deliver the, um, the improvements in, in how we manage our airspace uh, to, um, to give us the, the confidence that the net zero target can be, can be achieved. Thank you. That's brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Adam, um, am I under, to understand that you have to skip off or are you able to stick uh, around? No, I'm fine. I'm fine until um, just after 11 o'clock. So. Oh, brilliant. Okay, right. So we have a, a much more full panel. Um, just uh, before we get into our panel session uh, with Glenn Willem from uh, Airbus uh, and Toby Gibbs, um, I, I just got a couple of questions uh, from uh, the, the attendees. So uh, Joanna Richard is asking, uh, I think if I what happens if I push answer live um, uh, where will the sustainable uh, fuels come from uh, has it been looked at if there can be enough uh, and what is the efficiency associated with this so I guess it's really about the supply of uh, yeah, sustainable so, aviation fuels so in terms of the sourcing of the SAF there's no single uh, silver bullet uh, we as Rolls-Royce and, and we as sustainable aviation fuels are looking at a broad range of different foodstocks and technologies. Um, one of the beauties of, of using waste as a feedstock is that you don't have quite the same uh, issues around competition for land and water, and you don't have the same issues with food politics. Um, it also expands the capacity of the resource available. One of the difficulties is that there, there is quite possibly enough biomass, and there's quite possibly enough waste. In fact, there is enough biomass and waste to deliver the kinds of quantities of SAF that will be necessary in 2050. Unfortunately, you're competing with other um, potential end users who possibly have business models that are quite different from aviation and can support higher prices 
for those for those feedstocks. Right. And so, in addition to looking at uh, more advanced biomass sources, looking at um, the the possibilities of using waste. Uh, Rolls Royce and other companies have been looking at power to liquids. So power to liquids, you may more commonly know as e-fuels, where you have a step where electrolysis is used to generate hydrogen from from water, and then that hydrogen is combined with carbon, probably in the near term from carbon carbon from from industrial sources as the world starts to to increasingly de decarbonize its industry. Uh, and then eventually, hopefully, carbon sourced from uh, from direct air capture. Um, so, by combining, in answer to uh, in answer to the question, by combining biomass, by combining waste, and by combining uh, power to liquids, we'd like to think that we can we can provide a sufficient SAF to uh, to actually increasingly go beyond the sorts of ambitions that that we had only a few months ago when the roadmap was published. Brilliant. Okay, I've got a couple of other questions, but I'm going to weave them into our panel session because I'm, I'm eager to, to get going on that. Uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, Gwen Llewellyn uh, from Airbus um, and uh, Toby Gibbs uh, from his own company, uh, Logica. Uh, now, Tony and I have uh, something in common, uh, the British Aviation Group. So it's a trade body in the UK that represents, what is it, 250 plus companies in the uh, aviation space. And we're also on the uh, bag sustainable uh, working group. Uh, so we're looking at uh, sustainability from the aviation side. So Glenn, can I ask you first to give a bit of a summary uh, of, of your role within Airbus and, and what your plans are doing? Because uh, I'm, I'm very interested in, in Airbus going forward. Obviously, there's been a bit of challenge with, uh, with uh, aircraft production. And I'm just kind of curious if that's feeding down to some of the programs that you're in charge with. Sure. So I think I've unmuted myself. Um, great. Hello to everybody. Um, thanks for the invitation and thanks for the presentations up until now. Very interesting. Um, so Air Airbus has been involved in electrification and now what we more broadly uh, call zero emissions technology because what, what really we're doing electrification for uh, is to reduce the emissions, to bring uh, products onto the market which can be uh, carbon neutral and to achieve some of the plans that some of the previous speakers mentioned. Uh, we had the EFAN in um, flying across the English Channel in 2015, Vahana vertical takeoff and landing vehicle first flight in January 2018, uh, City Airbus again a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle in uh, having its first flight in May 2019 and we um, we had planned, and, and this is perhaps where, where your question is coming from, we had planned to fly the EFAN X in 2021. Um, so maybe if I can just explain what, what's happened to that program. We, we decided to, to stop it. Um, we decided that the, what's called serial hybrid architecture, which the EFAN X has been testing for us, through the paperwork that we've done, through the, the design work, simulation, and, uh, and testing, that that kind of architecture depends so highly on uh, battery technology in particular, that it's, um, it's likely that we will get, the, um, get to the ambitious targets that we need to meet easier uh, and in a shorter time frame if we look at other vectors um, like new, new, ener new energies, uh, one of the speakers mentioned hydrogen earlier. Uh, hydrogen is a, it has very significant potential. It's one of the ingredients in uh, power to liquid synthetic fuels or e-fuels that, that um, uh, were just discussed. And it can also potentially be used to power directly aircraft, whether it's through uh, fuel cells, perhaps for smaller aircraft, or even directly into gas turbines for larger aircraft. And, and hydrogen can be generated or created uh, from renewable energy. Solar has multiplied by six in the last five years, wind by two in five years. So hydrogen is really a kind of a surrogate for electrification in a way, um, because it 
um, essentially can be generated from renewable means. And yeah, and, and that's really a, a key key focus for us now. Um, I don't know if, if some of you perhaps saw it in, in the first quarter of, of this year, Airbus um, updated its purpose, which is now we pioneer sustainable aerospace for a safe and united world. I think that's um, an important message uh, that at the top level of the company, uh, sustainability is is clearly now more than ever part of our agenda. That's brilliant. Thank you, um, Adam. Sorry, Toby. I'm just going to go, uh, jump into into Adam uh, and ask him to uh, speak a little bit more uh, about uh, his Rolls Royce uh, hat that he's wearing, uh, and maybe ask him to comment a little bit more on the Efan X because we have had a couple of questions or a, a question uh, in the audience uh, on on the program. Um, thank you, thank you for that, Dale. Um, in answer to the, the question on um, eFanX, I think I'd um, I'd make the comment that the project's arrived at, at a natural conclusion. So there's different elements to this, including uh, an element of ground testing. Uh, we will continue uh, as Rolls Royce to undertake ground testing of the technology going forwards. Uh, and we will look to integrate the technology, uh, the power system, into any future aircraft that requires the technology. Um, I think it's important to recognise that um, we we have generated um, ourselves, and I suspect Airbus too, generated value from the from the collaboration. Uh, and um, I guess you know, one of the one of the the uh, questions that people will be asking is how has COVID um, impacted the pace at which electrification is likely to, to, to happen? And I think it would be an extremely brave person to, um, to say whether it will speed it up or slow, slow it down. But, uh, but I'm fairly confident that it will have some impact uh, in terms of the, uh, the timing of the, the sorts of the sorts of technologies that are coming out of um, projects such as eFanex. Right. Well, that, that, that's interesting because uh, just according to our poll here, um, fifty percent of them are expecting COVID to uh, impact the uh, development of sustainable aviation fuels, um, and there's a, an expectation that it's going to accelerate uh, the drive towards uh, electric aviation. Uh, but then again, we only have 64 to the 83 attendees who have answered that poll. So uh, I'd encourage you to uh, please uh, step in uh, and uh, fill out that poll. Um, I'd make, I'd, I mean, I'd, in answer to that, I'd make the comment that clearly any form of disruption within aviation has the scope to accelerate technology development. At the same time, there's some evidence that the aviation sector is going to be, be hit hard for some time to come. And that will have a corresponding impact on the ability of some, if not all of the players to invest across all of the different, um, all of the different technologies. Right, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm eager now to hear from Toby um, about uh, the, the, the side of, of the airports and their role in helping to reduce uh, the impact of carbon uh, and aviation. Sure, thanks, Daryl. Um, well, I, I've been working, I've been leading the environmental work on the Heathrow expansion project for much of the last 10 years. Um, so I, I think in, in a relatively good position to answer this question, I think it's important, first of all, to understand some of the context. Um, if I go back to 2011 um, when the airports commission was formed um, it's fair to say that local environmental impacts were probably the largest environmental issues um, associated with aviation particularly noise at Heathrow um, and, and, and that also moved on to, to air quality but, but over the last five years of course um, carbon emissions has become um, absolutely absolutely the most important um, consideration. Um, I mean airports can do, do a number of things of course they can on the ground they can make their own infrastructure more carbon efficient but uh, depending on the nature of the flights that leave an airport you're probably only ever going to make uh, all the carbon emissions from from those on the ground activities are probably only going to save um, up to 10% of 
carbon emissions when you consider what's happening in the air. So it really is in the um, in the air where the where the, where the biggest um, savings can be made. Airports can of course impose um, higher landing charges on on um, older aircraft. They need to put the infrastructure in, whether it be for in the future. Um, planes powered by electric or whether it be for um, sustainable aviation fuels, although my understanding of that is that the infrastructure is not too different from the infrastructure that already exists. Um, I think what we're going to see um, over the next uh, few months will be really interesting. Um, as the aviation sector begins hopefully to pick up again, what we are going to see is some of the retirement of the older aircraft. Um, and that will mean proportionally we'll see that um, carbon emissions will will drop anyway and that's got to be a good thing and and as they are retired as the aviation sector comes back of course there will be the opportunity for aircraft using newer technologies to come in as the sector as I say increases so I think that um, although there is going to be a focus from the airports and of course the airlines on getting back to something that looks like a norm it will be a different norm undoubtedly um, and I think, you know, of course, it will be a better norm. Right. OK, um, I have a bit of a question, obviously, because of the lockdown, the, the price of oil has absolutely crashed uh, through the floor. Uh, there was a point when they were practically giving it away in, in a negative price uh, for oil. Now it's, it's floating somewhere around uh, 30 uh, US dollars a barrel, I believe. Um, I'm just kind of curious whether or not um, this, this low cost of fuel is, is going to impact uh, the uptake of uh, SAFs uh, and how long would you expect that to happen for? I'd expect oil prices to, to bounce back, but there's just so much available. Uh, I, I would expect those, uh, those costs to be re repressed for quite a while, uh, especially considering that the fuel cost is such a high proportion of airline operated costs. So Glenn, Adam, Toby, uh, please discuss. It's so Glenn Llewellyn from Airbus. Can I go first, Daryl? So, um, so at present, less than. Go ahead, Adam. Um, so at present, less than one percent of the world's aviation fuel is in the form of SAF. Uh, yes, you would expect a long-term reduction in in oil price to impact the attractiveness of um, sustainable aviation fuels, but I I suspect that um, oil prices will have will have. Um, will have uh, overcome or, or got over the, the impact of COVID-19 mm. long before we start to see volumes of SAF that, um, that would be affected by those, those, kinds of, um, those kinds of issues. Clearly, one of the things that we need to do is make sure that in a low, low price oil world, that investment is still going into first of a kind pilot plants of the sort being proposed by Velocis, Lander Tech, Fulcom, etc., mm -hmm. and um, it it will be interesting to see what happens to investment in in those and and the extent to which they have to be uh, they have to be supported uh, in order to um, to get them over that initial um, funding gap associated with the uh, with the capex. Right, Glenn, you were going to say. Yeah, I think um, maybe. Just uh, uh, some more info compared to what Adam just said. The we've we've seen in the last few days even uh, announcements from IAG and from Lufthansa highlighting their commitment and their financial investment in um, developing sustainable aviation fuel further with various partners. I think that's a very strong sign. I think especially in the current crisis where uh, the sector is, is like was stated there, um, in, a, in a cash crisis. Uh, the, the fact that airlines are coming out and investing in these technologies, uh, preparing for the recovery to be more sustainable, uh, I think is a very positive sign and something which uh, uh, shows that even with oil prices as they are, um, there's a, still a huge appetite to uh, support the transition. 
I, I'd, I'd, absolutely, I'd absolutely agree with that. We, um, unfortunately, IG, um, they were going to be uh, on the panel. Um, Jonathan Council, I think it is from uh, IG, uh, unfortunately he couldn't make it. Uh, it really would have been interesting to hear their point of view on that, but maybe perhaps we can send him some questions later uh, and he might have an opportunity to either participate uh, through the virtual networking event that Eric is gonna organize or just some answering back uh, to the panel. Uh, Toby, your, your thoughts in terms of uh, the price of oil and, and whether or not this, the COVID-19 is too short of a blip uh, to really make any impact? I think, I think what, we've, what we're sort of neglecting to consider here really is, is, is the public's opinion on all of this. And, and what we've seen over the last two or three years, um, you know, particularly in, in, in Europe and Western Europe is a is a change in, 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 in philosophy around, around aviation. I think, I think aviation and, and Adam's presentation demonstrated this um, you know, quite clearly. Av aviation is, probably gets a, a rather unfair rap given the level of global emissions it gets you know, when considering, um, you know, when considered against other sectors um, uh, and industries, but, but it does need to do very much more. And, and, and there is a groundswell of opinion now with the general public that it needs to do more. So in order for us to have a sustainable aviation sector, it's not just that, you know, we, we need to be demonstrating environmental sustainability, I think, to, to the general public. So I think they're going to demand this continuation um, around investment in sustainable aviation fuel um, and, and other forms of aircraft, uh, you know, powered by other types of fuel other than um, our traditional aviation fuel. So I think it's, um, you know, I think, I, think, I think they're the key things in, in all of this. And as we begin to see the recovery, they will be expecting higher uptake of sustainable aviation fuel, um, you know, I, 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 as we move forward. Definitely. Um, okay, so I've, I've got um, a question here from Anchor Dio from uh, Travel Radar, uh, and basically asking uh, if we're heading towards a paradigm shift in terms of accelerating ourselves towards sustainable uh, aviation and noting the retirement of older four uh, engined aircraft um, as airlines are craving more and more uh, efficient aircraft. Um, so the question is, are we heading towards that future where aviation will be more efficient uh, at a much faster rate than ever before? Do you, do you see the investment going in, in to, to accelerate um, uh, sustainable aviation? Uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Glenn. I think the, the reality of the situation is that um, everybody's uh, concerned about cash. Uh, the, um, I think acceleration is probably not the term I'd use, um, at least for the foreseeable months until the situation is, is well understood. Um, there's certainly an appetite to accelerate. There's a, 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 a societal demand. There's a business need um, to accelerate. But we have to ensure that we all, uh, whether it's aircraft manufacturers, engine manufacturers, um, airlines, that we come out of the crisis in a healthy position to be able to accelerate. Um, the acceleration in the very short term, I think, is is difficult for all of us to imagine as we um, as we prepare for the the recovery. Adam, right. Perhaps uh, Toby, you, you you might have something to share on on that. Okay. Yeah, sure. Sorry, Adam. Um... Oh, you, you go, Adam. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, okay, I'll go while well, Adam's not there. Um, I think I said earlier, you know, we are seeing some of the older and more inefficient aircraft being retired. Um, and, and that, of course, is going to lead to, um, uh, you know, carbon benefits, you know, going forward. Um, they will be replaced by more efficient aircraft, whether they be um, aircraft that are flying on sustainable aviation fuel or more traditional fuel, they'll burn less. Um, you know, so, 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 you know, I think, I think that has to be a good thing. I think, um, one of the things I'm slightly nervous about, and, and Adam alluded to this earlier on, which is that there is, um, we could see considerable carbon benefits by just making 
um, the way we fly our aircraft and the airspace more efficient. And what I'm more nervous about is that it inevitably there's a cost associated with redesigning our airspace. And um, at the moment, you know, the, the, the industry is having a very difficult time. Um, so how quickly will it take to us getting back to a point where we can start thinking again about a more efficient um, airspace architecture? Um, when will the invest investment be made available for that? Because I think that's not a priority. And we did see good, strong movement, particularly in the UK, around this before the COVID-19 crisis. Is that likely to continue? Because there's real benefits to be had there. Yeah, I definitely agree. I know that Nats have been working uh, quite diligently on all of their, their former LAMP program um, in, in terms of reorganizing airspace and starting to control aircraft that are uh, much further out uh, from landing in the UK so that they can reduce the uh, queuing over the skies of London and, and they've made great strides there. Um, sorry, Adam, are you still with us? Uh, can Can you hear me now? Yes, so we can, sir. Good. Um, so, uh, really echoing a couple of the points made um, by the other two um, panelists, then that um, yes, I can I can already see an appetite associated with uh, or coming from end users and, and customers from for more efficient aviation. But in order to deliver that, the other thing that's necessary apart from just a, uh, an appetite is investment. So I you know I know working for an organisation such as Rolls Royce the enormous amounts of investment that are necessary to deliver even a 1% improvement in, in SFC. And one of the things that the industry will have, to, um, will have to do going forward is find a way to continue to make investment in the necessary R&D at the engine level, at the aircraft level. And, and clearly, Governments around the world, including the UK government, can can have a part to um, to play in that, alongside the part they play in in helping to deliver SAF, airspace modernisation, uh, and all of the other uh, possible decarbonisation routes going forward. Brilliant. Um, we've had quite a few questions come through on the Q and A side, uh, and a lot of them are revolving around. Um, the EFAN X programs, uh, which I know that we have discussed, um, I think probably given the time that we have, what we'll try and do is wrap some of those questions up um, and put them to our panelists and hopefully they'll be able to respond uh, to the group and, and maybe contribute uh, during the uh, virtual networking session uh, that Eric uh, is, is working on. Um, there's some questions about hydrogen. Uh, I know we haven't necessarily gotten into that. Um, so with, with that, I'm just gonna ask our, our speakers to, to give a, a quick minute, to, a quick one minute roundup uh, of, uh, of their thoughts on sustainability and aviation uh, and the work that they're doing. Uh, we'll start with uh, Glenn, move on to Toby, and, and then uh, finally finish with, uh, with Adam. Uh, I think we start to be clear about what we uh, can do. I think we start to see that uh, there's a lot of uh, solutions which are technically viable. There, there are some um, like hydrogen, like um, uh, certain ele electric or hybrid electric parallel solutions, which we still believe are, are promising. I think we, we have pretty solid uh, roadmaps which we can uh, put into place, which we're putting into place to reduce significantly aviation's uh, climate impact. And uh, there's a huge motivation uh, in the industry to to implement them. I think um, the collection of people uh, in this forum uh, proved that and we're going to make it happen independent of the crisis, which for sure will uh, slow certain things down. But I think the ambition is definitely there to continue. Brilliant, thank you. Toby. Um, yeah, I was just gonna make the point, I think that um, what we're beginning to see and what has to continue is that sustainability and particularly environmental sustainability is embedded in every part of the sector right from the very start. So from the point where you design a new piece of infrastructure, um, a new airport, a new runway, um, to the point where you know the aircraft takes off, um, environment has to not just be a consideration, it has to be fully embedded within the, you know, within every sector, within every part of the design. Um, if we are going to achieve what, achieve what our 
you know, very, very difficult ambitions. They really are. Um, and, and, and as I said, I've seen much more of that occurring over the last few years. There's still areas where I think we could improve. Um, but, you know, certainly I'm being asked on to design teams or being asked to get involved much more, you know, much earlier in the process than I would have been perhaps 10 or 15 years ago. So that's a good thing. And, you know, it just needs to continue. Brilliant. Uh, and, and I also know that um, through, through the work that we're doing on the British Aviation Group, trying to engage our members uh, to, to address the entire uh, life cycle uh, of, of infrastructure investment because you're, you're right it absolutely goes from from the approach roads to the airports and the parking lots and the energy systems that you have all all the way through to how you maintain and operate uh, runways and, and we're all invested in, in trying to reduce the the carbon footprint of, of, uh, of aviation so it, yeah, it, I, it's, it's great to hear I, I think that's absolutely right Darrell. I think it's also just worth mentioning that what we're finding from that work on the British aviation group is that you know, you know, the UK is real world leaders in all of this, you know, we are obviously, uh, a, a, you know, a, a very mature sector, both aviation and environmental sustainability in the UK, and we're bringing that together. And it, and it really is a, you know, a, a class leading sort of global offer, no doubt about that. Brilliant. Uh, Adam, uh, can you take us to your, your yes. last remarks? Yes, can you hear me this? Yes. Yep. Great. Great. Um, so I suppose that uh, in rounding up on sustainability in aviation and taking a, a decarbonisation perspective, I'd probably uh, probably uh, draw on the experiences I had in a previous life helping to decarbonise the energy sector in the late 90s and early 2000s. And there are certain things that we can learn from sectors which were a little bit further ahead in the process than, than aviation. So it's it was apparent in, in energy that you can't always tell how far and how fast you need to go. And I think we're starting to get some resolution of those questions with a move towards uh, net zero in a 2050 timescale. Uh, you need to break down the silos. So certainly in the energy sector, your, your view on what the answer was was heavily dependent upon what your background was. So if you were an aerodynamicist, you thought it was wind. If you were a nuclear engineer, you thought it was nuclear. Uh, if you were a biologist, you thought it was, you know, bioenergy. And actually, um, very quickly, you realise that all of those technologies are absolutely necessary. And the work that we've done through SA on the carbon roadmap demonstrates there's no silver bullet. We need everything and we need to progress everything now. And the sooner, A, we start to drive forward those technologies, but also start to engage with external ecosystems that we haven't had to work with in the past, the sooner we can start to um, to put those solutions together. Brilliant. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, that was absolutely uh, amazing. Uh, I really appreciate the time uh, that you put into it. Um, uh, as I said, there's been several questions that have come through on on the Q and A side, and I don't think we we. We'll, we'll never have enough time to answer them all, uh, but we'll try and collate those together uh, and get them out to you. If, if you have the ability to respond to them, uh, that would be greatly appreciated and, and they could form the basis of our uh, networking events uh, that, that we're planning on, on having. So uh, again, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have yeah. now a uh, scheduled break uh, and uh, we'll be coming back at what time? Uh, 11.30, uh, we're gonna come back. Um, and we're going to hear from uh, the CAA, Frederick Lugar, uh, Caden Stanzione, uh, the CEO from Jaunt Air Mobility, Graham Cooper, uh, Project Director, uh, Decarbonization of Transport for the National Grid, but that's going to be a, a video uh, pre-recorded session. Uh, and then we have Lawrence Blakely, uh, the Head of Power Supply uh, from uh, Vertical Aerospace. So. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, all, all the speakers this morning. Uh, it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, we now have about a 25 minute break. We'll be back here at 11.30 sharp. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.